Thank you very much for coming. My name is Frank Fortunato. We're with CADEX, obviously, and the CADEX people here can just raise their hands. Uh, we're not going to go through any uh, sales demonstration or pitch or anything like that. Um, I almost feel like talking about that uh, game Three Degrees with Kevin Bacon. Uh, everybody here is sort of uh, connected to us in some way, shape, or form by a number of different degrees, and we're happy to have everybody here in one room. Really, uh, for the first time for us, we're going to hold a similar event in New York in the spring. So uh, this is a good dry run for us. When we first came to London uh, 17 years ago, that very first visit, we had the uh, good fortune of meeting uh, two very important people for us. One was Tom Bolt and uh, one was John Hamblin. And uh, miraculously, since then, they've continued to agree to be seen in public with us and uh, continue to answer our emails and continue to talk to us. So we figured it was only appropriate that for the uh, presentation part of the program today, which will be mercifully short, don't worry, uh, there's plenty of wine and food there, uh, we would ask each of them to say a few words. So we'll start with Tom, uh, who needs no introduction, uh, from Lloyd's. And then uh, afterwards, we'll talk to John and hear what he has to say. So Tom Bolt. All right. Thank you. Uh, you'll, you'll, note, you'll note with interest, and you may want to move up because I have a Kansas monotone with a very soft delivery. Um, you'll note with interest he used the word mercifully short. I'm the merciful part. <laughs> and then you see the relative height between Mr. Hamlin and myself. You also know I'm the short part. Um, but anyway, I think it's, it's quite fitting that you're having a reception here for CADEX at this point. And, and if you go back, uh, Lloyd's is now 325 years old, if you don't care about exactly the day they started. Um, and uh, in that 325 years ago, it started off basically as a coffee house where people would go and have coffee. And since the bulk of the people having the coffee were ship owners and cargo owners, they would uh, decide to do something about the fact they had risks, that if any one of those ships went down, they'd be ruined. And so they began to swap uh, liabilities with each other. And that's where the phrases underwriter came because they signed under the line. There was a description of the vessel, and that became the slip. And the other thing is they had waiters. And, and the, one of the few things that hasn't changed is they roughly look like the ones you see now, at least as to girth. And the, um, and the waiters, in addition to serving the coffee and moving the slips around the room, would be sent out by Edward Lloyd early in the morning to get gossip. Uh, from the ship owners up and down the thing because they'd put up these little sheets not unlike the Reuters sheets you see in the room now and that would be the basis under which information about vessels would come in and the rest and and so the waiters were quite important because they were sort of the first you know verbal Reuters network that would spread information also the nature of the original risks being uh, marine risks you know the notion we have three years of account in our accounting methods here at Lloyd's it, it is largely due to the time it took to find out whether a vessel arrived safely or not. And it also is pretty darn convenient if you're writing risks all year long and the last one has 12 months to expire. You're not done taking risk until 24 months, and you probably don't hear about it, unless, of course, you use CADEX, of course, on the, uh, on the, uh, for, for another 12 months. And so the information flows are pretty interesting and arbitrary. So data from the beginning has been all important. Now, there were probably some points in our history at Lloyd's where data may not have seemed as important as it actually was. I had I used to come over when I first worked in the reinsurance part of Berkshire and first met John. Uh, the uh, I'd come over five times a year for two weeks of time. I'd meet people and I'd try and find deals so I could pay for the trip, and you know, Berkshire being expense oriented. And uh, and so I got back to New York and I got a fax which also dates me. Uh, a little bit. I got this fax, and this guy said, you met this fellow last week. He's looking for some protection for a layer, half a million excess, a million and a half. He writes about this much in income. I send back a fax, which I think is fairly considered and thoughtful. said, could you tell me a little about his business? I received a fax back before the close of business that night, and it said, sorry, no need to provide further information, risk fully placed. And that's the way the world used to work. But it worked that way because almost every transaction was in the room. You could see who was doing what with who. You could have sort of a gauge. And there's sort of a, a, a being a part of the fabric of that. In the way the world works now, there's no way in the world you can see enough to know anything about what's going on. And often what, the, what you see in the room might as well be a head fake because you don't get to see the whole deal. 
And if you just go based on what you see there, you probably will make just as many errors of omission or commission. And so um, we have, and then after that, if and John will remember this well, you, you went to a slightly higher standard where there was the Kelly questionnaire, which was seven pages of information about US crestosomes, stuff like that. And that, that gave us a little more of a description of what we're doing in our aggregates and began to actually give people the ability to tot up how much they'd written, which uh, a few underwriters may have wished they'd done before they blew themselves up. And nowadays, it's probably gone at some level of abstraction to the other extreme where we have a lot of data, but it's so much data that unless you know how to hook your mouth up to the fire hose and figure out how to digest it, you, there's no way you can actually make sense of it unless it's presented in an organized way. So data mining, data understanding, and most importantly, understanding the weaknesses and strengths of the given models is very, very important to what you do. And I was visiting uh, the LMA, Property Underwriters Subcommittee, and I walked in, and the, there's a bunch of folks I'd never met before, and one of the older fellows says, you're not the kind of guy who's going to make us all use those models, are you? I said, well, well, let's talk about that for a second. I have my own, you know, skepticism about models. I worry about them. I don't think they fully incorporate parameter risk and some of the other features. I often think the people who use the models don't quite understand them. And so I look at the model as a skeleton on which you hang the rest of your underwriting thinking. And they're very, very good for giving you a description, assuming they're filled in right and the data integrity is there for what goes into it. They're very good at giving you a description of what your exposure is. As to their probabilities and the rest of, you know, <laughs> Uh, the to the Tohoku earthquake actually happened about 832 years ago, and in fact there are some signs on the side of the hill, don't build below here, obviously nobody read. And, and so when that was mentioned at one of the modeling uh, group seminars here in London, uh, one of the people said, well, how come you didn't tell us about that? They said, well, we did have it in the event set, but you guys don't look past the one in 250, one in 500, and that's once in 832 years, so you didn't investigate the model enough to know that it was there and you didn't really look at it that seriously. So I told this fellow, I said, look, it's a, it's a skeleton on which you can hang the rest of your underwriting thinking. And the way to think about that is, you know, a skeleton isn't a whole human. By the way, a human without a skeleton ain't much of a human either. So you could decide what you want to do. Now, when a guy who sits in my chair, I'm not that smart, but the guy who sits in my chair generally carries a little weight. And when you say that to people, you might think they'd take it up, but he kept battling and battling. I said, I'll tell you what, right here, right now, I'm giving you a dispensation not to use models if you'd like. And he said, oh, okay. I said, but I want you to know something. That guy sitting across the table from you, he is a bit younger, but he actively uses his models. So when he figures out something's wrong with his portfolio, he's going to fix the one item that needs fixing. You, however, my friend, are going to have to raise your prices 5% across the board, and the market's going to pick you off. He's going to eat your lunch, and you're not going to make any money. But if that's what you want me to say yes to, I'm willing to do it today. So um, we put a certain importance on data, data integrity, and all that. But when I took the job, they asked me about data issues and things like that in the interview. And I said, well, I look at Lloyd's sort of like the British Library if there were no Dewey Decimal System. And even if you're lucky enough to find the book you want, the pages aren't in the right order. So there's this incredibly valuable mine of data. And it's taken us seven, eight years to get it in some form where we can begin, just begin to slice and dice it in the way you would expect, given what you'd expect us to have access to. And we're beginning to get some very fruitful reports out of that. But the key thing that when we look at this and the pitfalls and perils of modeling and model weaknesses stuff, and I go back to that meeting I was at where one of the modeling agencies was telling people about things. And some guy's whining about the fact that Tohoku Quake wasn't in in a certain way. I was like, listen, this is like you're complaining about, I own a ball-peen hammer. And a ball-peen hammer is not hitting in every nail equally well. Well, use the thing for the tool that it's designed for. And that's what we think. And one of the ways you can do that is by interrogating your models with the use of information, such as what you would get through CATEX or some of the other ways you try and mine the data. Where do I think I'm particularly worried? I'm particularly worried about what we get in binder data. Do I really understand the aggregations of risks that are in our binder book? Yeah, you know, sort of. You know, you can have a, one of these ISO 9000 or whatever processes, but if all you're doing is wrapping up junk, you still have junk. So we think there's lots of room to do a better job for business owners and business managers within the London market and that. And I'm not saying everybody's bad. I'm just saying it's pretty uneven. And I'm not sure, as shown when um, 
RMS changed its model. And people came in and said, we don't really like RMS anymore. We think we ought to use the AAR model. I said, well, why? You've never once told me why the RMS model was perfect for your business, how it fit it like a glove and it was everything. And so since you really just always lived with the output, guess what? You get to still live with the output, and I'm not letting you change your model. And, but if another person came in and said, as one of the syndicates did, we think RMS is light on storm surge and some other things, and they actually loaded their own capital assessment by another 25 million pounds. So when RMS made its model change, they didn't actually have much of a change at all. And even if they told me, we think ARR fits our model better now, I would have been very inclined to work with them on that because they actually interrogated, understood the model, they had their own data to challenge it. So um, I'm a, long and short of it is I'm, I'm a big fan of, of using tools. I'm a big fan of understanding that. I'm a skeptic on parameter risk. I think you need to challenge your data, but how do you challenge your model if you don't have underlying data to say, does this seem reasonable? And one of the great things about Lloyd's underwriters over the years is you've been able to give all sorts of formulaic information, but based on their history, their experience, their expertise, they actually say, you know what, this doesn't seem reasonable. Maybe it's too conservative, maybe it's too liberal, maybe it's too aggressive, whatever. But that's what makes the difference between Lloyd's and just doing some capital allocation model that you can get from a lot of people, is that they're individual stock pickers, in a sense, who actually understand how to think about that stock and what's likely to happen, in a sense, with that risk. So uh, anything we do nowadays, we try to figure out, is it a way to help foster and encourage in terms of you know the educational programs we have. I have this, uh, for those of you who are uh, British, you'll understand this even better. Uh, we set up a thing, a series called If Only I'd Known. Now, the reason I did that is so I could abbreviate in the Lloyd's tradition of three-letter acronyms, the OIC series. And so the OIC series is one where actually some of the older guys in the market stand up and say, this is where I screwed up, this is where you may not want to screw up, and they've been surprisingly and refreshingly candid about where you ought to watch out for things. Because we have a young group of people, and the expression I used in my former employer is, we're always trying to find ways to get great old wine into new young bottles. How do we do that? How do you pass that on? And some of the oral tradition of sitting in the box until the guy next to you dies and you get to move into the good seat, you know, that, that's sort of gone. And, uh, and there's also so, not all the sort of interaction you used to have. And so we're trying to encourage that through all sorts of different ways, the SOIC series and some other things. So a combination of trying to help you have enough of a fabric from your own experience, enough data to challenge things, and an approach where you do question what comes out of a model so that you don't make a mistake that uh, you know, technically was correct but in every other way was wrong. That's, that's a big goal of ours now. And so services such as CADEX and other systems which provide that information in an interesting way are very, very useful to that process. Now having bored you to tears about this aspect of things, I thought you're in for a much better treat when you get to hear from the, uh, let's see, not short and not merciful uh, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Hamlin, who I have referred to as one of the healthiest skeptics in the market. After you hear him speak, you can decide whether he's really a healthy guy or whether he's a healthily skeptic. So thanks. Thank you very much. Um, a long time ago, when uh, I met John, we uh, we realized we shared a common interest in, of all things, World War One. And uh, since that time, and probably my uh, 40 or 45 visits here, I have never failed to come to London without uh, purchasing a book about World War One to give to John. And uh, his wife is probably ready to kill me. I've uh, inadvertently added to his library. So we had asked him to uh, think about preparing a little discussion on a on a different type of carnage. And uh, it was originally scheduled for uh, much closer to your Remembrance Day, uh, but we had to cancel because of the effects of Hurricane Sandy, so we generously agreed to, to redo it. So John will uh, talk a little bit about that, then we'll continue to drink and eat. Do that. Don't applaud until you've heard it. <coughs> you may be uh, wondering why you're about to be inflicted with my hobby at an insurance gathering, and the answer to that you can blame Frank because he seems to have a bigger obsession with uh, what I do in my spare time than I do. Uh, but when it comes to the Great War and remembering those who took part in it, um, I am an anorak, I'm afraid, and there's no other way to describe it. But it's fair to say that um, probably everyone in this room has someone in their family tree who took part in what up until 1939 at least 
was the greatest and most costly military contra uh, conflict in history. And one of the legacies of that terrible war is the number of war memorials we have in the nation. There were around 16,000 towns, villages and cities in 1914, and only 42 of them do not have a war memorial. That's to say that there are only 42 villages in the entire British Isles where all their young men came home. We walk past them every day, but my problem is I can't walk past the memorial without looking at the names and wondering who they were, where they lived, where they were born, who their families were, what they did for a living, what units they joined, and, and especially what happened to them. And this event developed into something of a mild obsession. So starting with my local war memorial, uh -huh, I began to find out about the, the men whose names were on it. And um, if you don't know who they are, then it is just that. It's just a list of names. So I brought the, effort, the, the results of my efforts onto the web through the village website. Uh, and began getting emails from relatives and other researchers and historians uh, with photographs and more information, and that I just got worse. Then I upped my game uh, and decided to get more ambitious, so I now, I've now added the memorials to the old boys of the King's School, Canterbury, where my daughters went to school, and my old school, Lansing College. And between them, that's some 600 stories uh, from both wars, which are now on the school website. And in the short time available, I thought I'd take you on a quick dash through some of the reasons why the war was quite so devastating and then share with you the sorts of things that turn up when you start digging if you know where to look. At the beginning of the World War I, the British Army had around 250,000 regular soldiers. The German Army numbered some five and a half million men. Uh, and by 1918, the UK had around eight million men and, of course, by then women in uniform. And the man largely responsible for expanding the army was this gentleman, uh, Lord Kitchener, Secretary of War, perhaps one of the most iconic posters ever produced. And Kitchener wrote, my, my government has declared war on the most powerful military nation in the world, and yet they have no army. So he set out to recruit a volunteer army, obviously of, of citizen soldiers, and called on the men of Britain to fight for king and country. And even he was taken by surprise by the hundreds of thousands of men from all walks of life uh, that flocked to join up with a sense of patriotism and adventure. This was going to be way more exciting than working in a factory or office, uh, and if you didn't join soon, it would all be over. And scenes like this were repeated at recruiting stations across Britain and Great Britain and the Empire. Um, by 1915, these new recruits were arriving in France and Belgium in their thousands, which was just as well, because by Christmas 1914, the professional regular army had almost ceased to exist. Uh, as you'll know, the war became synonymous with trench warfare, these were largely dug for protection because the land was so flat, and by the end of 1914, they stretched from the coast of Belgium to the Swiss border. This is an early example near Ypres in uh, late 1914. They would typically spend 48 hours in one of these, and then 48 hours in a similar one about 200 yards further back. Uh, this is a, mu a later, much more sophisticated version. Uh, this is, in fact, a captured German trench near La Boisselle on the Somme. Uh, the trench would protect you from most things other than a direct hit from an artillery shell. And you'll notice there is little in the way of shelter. Uh, most of the guys just uh, sort of scraped a hole in the side of the, of the trench and slept there. Sleeping in the open, if it rained, you got wet. Of course, there were rats and you were infested with lice, whether you were an officer or an enlisted man. And in order to break these lines, the war effectively develops into a siege uh, with an almost constant barrage of artillery. These were punctuated by repeated often fruitless attempts by both sides to break the enemy line uh, with waves of infantry attacks against a hail of rifle and machine gun fire. And Winston Churchill, who was a man never short of a good quote, wrote in 1916, <clears throat> when will our generals learn that you cannot fight machine guns with the breasts of gallant men? And the line wasn't permanently broken by either side until the 8th of August 1918, four years and four days from when the war began. If you were wounded, You'd be carried back uh, by your comrades, regardless of the conditions. This is Passchendaele in 1917. If you could walk, you would make your own way back. And needless to say, large numbers of men died because their wounds became infected uh, with the mud. My early interest in the Great War was kindled because I had the great good fortune to know one particular Great War veteran very well. And this is Leslie, uh, Lieutenant Leslie Donald Hamblin, 17th Battalion Royal Fusiliers, 7th Squadron Royal Flying Corps, my grandfather. Now, Les survived the war, which is why you're having to listen to this. Uh, and he was typical of his generation that he really didn't talk to his immediate family about his experiences, but he did, for some reason, talk to me about it when we used to go up to the pub. He joined up at the age of 16 simply by moving his date of birth back two years, 
and joined the infantry, but quickly realized, because he was many things, but he wasn't stupid, that this was not a good idea, as because the casualty lists from the battalion at the front were posted on a wall on his training depot every day, and they were getting longer as time went on. So he decided to play for time and applied for a commission as an officer in the knowledge that this would prolong his deployment to the front. As his training neared completion, he decided to prolong his departure still further by learning to fly. So he applied for the Royal Flying Corps, which was a hideous mistake because unknown to him, uh, while the life expectancy of a junior officer in the infantry on the Western Front was six weeks before he could expect to be killed or seriously injured, in the Flying Corps, it was three weeks. So Les completed his training, he was posted to number seven fighter squadron, and during his short time with them, he was credited with a quarter of a kill. That's to say he claimed to have shot down an enemy aircraft, uh, but then so did three other guys, and so they split it four ways. Uh, at this stage, the score was Hamblin a quarter, Germany nil. After six weeks of the squadron, he became a ferry pilot. Whether they decided or he decided that he wasn't really cut out to be a fighter boy, uh, he moved to uh, ferrying new aircraft out to the front and then taking smashed up ones back to England for repair. And all was going swimmingly until October 1918, when he was taking off from an airfield behind the front line and was attacked by a German Fokker D7 with this result. <clears throat> you will notice that the wreckage is surrounded by American doughboys who sent him a copy of this picture. As you know, the Yanks always arrive just in the nick of time. Uh, incredibly, he survived uh, to become a travelling salesman for a firm of builders. So his war finished uh, Tom a quarter, sorry, Hamblin, sorry, Hamblin a quarter, Germans one, uh, which, as Tom will tell you, is a 400% loss ratio. So it was lucky the Flying Corps had no franchise performance director. <laughs> this gentleman is Lawrence Tuttiet. Lawrence went to my old school, Lansing College, and was 23 when the war broke out, and he pulled a few strings because a mate of his was raising a battalion in the Royal Sussex Regiment. 1915, he married his childhood sweetheart, Francis, and went to France with the battalion later that year. On the 3rd of September, 1916, uh, the Royal Sussex were involved in an attack on Beaumont Hamel on the Somme, and Lawrence went missing. And a few days later, his wife, Francis, received a telegram. Regret to inform you, Captain L.W. Tuttiet, Royal Sussex Regiment, reported missing September 3rd. This does not necessarily mean he is either wounded or killed. Any further news, if received, will be posted immediately. And that's where Lawrence's story ended. Uh, the trail goes cold. He was simply one of tens of thousands of men who went missing on the Somme and whose bodies were never recovered. But, of course, <clears throat> that's not good enough for an anorak. So I was determined to see if I could find out more, and I went to the National Archives to go through his service file, which I had discovered was survived and is kept there. And in the front of the file was a letter dated 28th of May, 1920, in the most appalling English, <clears throat> which at one time had had three photographs attached, and the following is word for word. To the military government in London, enclosed, I send three photos which I got from a dying English captain. He is the man left in the officer photo marked X. I found him dying and was present when he closed his eyes forever. It was impossible to give this officer a resting place because the fire was too strong the following days. This argument gives me occasion to think that the fallen held is signed and the lost list is missing. Therefore, I beg the government to send to the wife left behind. Her husband was captain in the Sussex Regiment. The officer fell at the Somme on the 3rd of September 1916. I hope it is possible for the government to find the address of the wife and please will you send her the letter and pictures that she can be informed. I remain Johannes Muller, formerly of the Bavarian Regiment. So he had kept those photographs for three years, and not only said that, so he'd survived the war. And the War Office quickly went into action and established that Lawrence Tuttiet was one of seven Royal Sussex officers that went missing that day, but he was the only one that was married. So a couple of days later, they wrote to Francis with the photographs, and she wrote back saying that was her husband, and uh, could she have Muller's address so she could write to him. And on the 24th of June, the War Office wrote to her officially to say that her husband's name was now being removed from the list of missing. And he was now officially considered to have been killed in action on the 3rd of September. Now, Lawrence Tussiat died in a major battle of the Great War, but the British Army was losing 1,000 men a week during the Great War in what was called attrition or wastage. And the trenches were under regular artillery, mortar fire, there were illness, accidents, and, of course, snipers. Now, George de Salis also went to my old school, except unlike me, he won a scholarship. His photos always haunted me because I've seen a lot from that period, but he looks even younger 
and some of his peers of the same age. And on, on leaving school, he was immediately commissioned as a second lieutenant in March 17. He left for the front on the 20th of May, and in June, his battalion was holding a line near Arras where they were subject to occasional heavy shelling. On the night of the 24th, George was killed. So he'd been there a month. There was, it was very hard to find the information exactly what had happened to him, but I was lucky enough to come across a fellow anorak who had a copy of George's commanding officer's personal diary. Right off to my own heart. And this, the, the commanding officer had made this entry in his diary the following day. Showery. Heard that young de Salis was killed by a shell, shell last night in one court line. Buried him in the cemetery there in the afternoon. Very wet day. Quiet night. So George de Salis killed by a random shell at the age of 19, less than four weeks after he'd gone to France. The casual mention of his death alongside a weather uh, may seem callous, but George's commanding officer was losing men every single day. And finally, of all the men I've researched, I think this man, uh, for me, has exemplified all that was best about that generation. And this is Hugh Butterworth. Uh, he was born in New Zealand in 1885, educated at Marlborough and at University College Oxford. He was considered to be an outstanding sportsman. But in 1907, he returned to New Zealand, where he was employed as an assistant schoolmaster at the Wanganui Collegiate School, and he later became housemaster of Selwyn House. And on the outbreak of war, he decided he should return to England and join up. And he had this photograph taken shortly after he had made his decision. And his fellow teachers were highly amused at how warlike he was trying to look compared with his usual sunny demeanour. On his return to the UK, he was commissioned into the 9th Rifle Brigade, one of Kitchener's new army battalions, and he rose to be a temporary captain in command of D Company. He wrote regularly to a fellow teacher and friend of his at Wanganui. And these letters were published after the war. And of course, I've read them all. He was wonderfully self-deprecating, humorous, and always made light of the situation, no matter how difficult things were. And he was convinced that his commanding officer thought that he was a total amateur, and he was probably the worst soldier ever to wear the king's uniform. The papers show that, in reality, his commanding officer thought the world of him. In September 1915, the British High Command were planning a massive attack at Luz to, to attempt to break the German line for the winter. At the same time, they planned a series of diversionary attacks <clears throat> to prevent German troops moving to reinforce the men at Luz. As part of this plan, 9th Rifle Brigade, who were actually quite a long way north at Ypres, uh, were detailed to attack and hold the first two lines of the German trenches on the 25th of September. The night of the 24th, shortly before the attack, Hugh sat down in his dugout and wrote this letter to his friend back in New Zealand. Now, I've read this letter about 150 times. You'll have to forgive me if it doesn't, if it makes me wobble in places. I'm leaving this in the hands of the transport officer. And if I get knocked out, he will send it on to you. We're going into a big thing. It will be my pleasant duty to leap lightly over the parapet and lead D Company over the delectable confusion of old trenches, shell holes, and barbed wire that lies between us and the Bosch and take a portion of his front line. I shall then proceed to bomb down various communication trenches and take his second line. And in the very unlikely event of my being alive by then, I shall dig in like the blazes, and if God is good, stop the Bosch counterattack, which will come in an hour or two. If we stop that, I shall then in broad daylight have to get out, set out barbed wire in front of the trench under machine gun fire, and probably stop at least one more counterattack and a bomb attack from the flank. If all that happens successfully and I'm still alive, I am to hang on until relieved. When one is faced with a program like that, one touches up one's will. Thank heaven one has led a fairly amusing life. Thank God one is not married and trusts in providence. Unless we get more officers before the show, I am practically bound to be outed, and I shall have to lead all these things myself. Anyway, if I do go out, then I shall do so amidst such a scene of blood and iron as even this war has rarely witnessed. We are going to bombard for a week, explode a mine, and then charge. One does see life, doesn't one? Of course, there's always a chance of only being wounded and the off chance of pulling through. And of course, one has been facing death pretty intimately for months now, but with this ahead, one must realise that in the vernacular of New Zealand, one's numbers are probably up. We're not a sentimental crowd at the collegiate school, Wanganui, but I think in this letter of this sort, one can say how frightfully attached one is to the old brigade. Also, I am very much attached to the school and to Selwyn House in particular. There are 2,000 things I should like to say about what I feel.
but I can't put them down. Live long and prosper, all of you. Curiously enough, I don't doubt my power to stick it out, and I think my men will follow me. Hugh Butterworth was killed in action the following morning, 25th of September 1915, at the age of 29. His men, he and his men crossed no man's land, took the German first line, and fought their way up the communication trench where they were all killed. And his last concern was whether his men would follow him. Well, they did follow him, and 158 of them died with him on that day. And thanks for listening, and in case you're wondering what's next on my list, inspired by lunch with Frank, I'm already well in advance in researching the names on a certain memorial which hangs on the side of the Lloyds building. And I didn't know, which I've discovered, and you may not know, that one of those guys won the Victoria Cross. Well, I didn't know it, so watch out because it's coming your way soon. <laughs>